Please open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Chapter 5, starting in verse 4. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Let us pray. God, we are here this morning because you are worthy. Oh, Lord. You are worthy and you are coming soon and we want to be a people that are ready for you because you have not destined us for wrath but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, you know who's coming here today sleep and I, I beg you would wake them up and who's coming here dead and I pray you'd give them life. God, only you can do. I'm weak, God, but you are strong. I'm simply your messenger, Lord. Speak through me to these people, to your people that you love, your saints. And convince every one of them that you are at the very gates. And wake them up. Lord, let no one leave here today sleeping, drunk, careless, or even still in their sins. Holy Spirit, we beg you to come upon every heart here today to open their ears, to pay attention, to put away all distractions to heed to your words. Lord, give us a reverence as you speak through your word and silence our hearts. Oh God, only you can do this. So we ask this only in your name, precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The final words that our Lord speaks to us, as we've already read in Revelation, are words of great comfort, anticipation, and encouragement. As we read in Revelation, he says, surely I am coming soon. He says it three times. The return of the Lord is the great hope of the church. For we know that the Lord, after he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, And he's coming again. He's not going to leave us as orphans, but he's coming again to take us home to himself. That we might always be with him. In Mark 13, 34, Jesus illustrates his second coming. And he says, it's like a man going on a journey when he leaves his home and he puts his servants in charge. Each with his own work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Now the New Testament writers continue to speak of this day 
as if Jesus is at the very gates. James writes to us in chapter 5, the judge is at the door. Paul says in Philippians, the Lord is at hand. He is coming as a thief in the night, in an hour that no one expects, and he has forewarned us that it is so. Consider a farmer who receives a note with letters cut out from a magazine, and it says, behold, I am coming soon to plunder your property. This initially startles the farmer, but night after night went by, and the thief never came. And then one night, the farmer, being exhausted, began to get tired and sleep and forget that this thief was coming soon. And so he, he went up to bed without a thought of the nearness of the thief. It happened to be in the same night that the farmer's dog began barking viciously at the door because somebody was near. And now the farmer could do a few stupid things in that moment. The first thing would be he could take out his gun and shoot his dog because he wants sleep. The second would be to put a pillow over his face or headphones in his ears and listen to nice ocean sounds so he can ignore that dog's barking and finally get that good night of sleep. But the best thing for the farmer to do in that moment is to wake up, to jump out of bed and be ready for the thief. So brothers and sisters, today I am no... Nothing more to you than a barking dog telling you he's at the very gates, at the very door. He's near, closer than when we first believed, with his hand even upon the doorknob. In any moment, he will come. I'm God's messenger this morning to wake you up, to call you to wake up out of your sleep and drunkenness that you might be ready for the coming day of the Lord. And like a farmer, there's a bunch of stupid things you can do this morning. You can get on your phone and you can ignore me. You can fall asleep. You can be distracted with what you're going to eat for lunch or what you're going to do this week or tonight. You could shoot me. You could turn off my mic. But all these things would be very foolish. Don't shoot this dog that's calling you to wake up. Rather, pay attention And heed to these words, for the Lord is at the very gates. Many of you perhaps have come in this morning sleeping without having a single thought in the last few years or weeks or days of the nearness of Jesus Christ. I found myself in that very state very recently, forgetting he's near. And it's sadly become the pattern of the modern-day Christian, to forget the nearness of the Lord. And it's so contrary to the conduct of the early church who continuously hoped that Jesus would return. They lived for this day. Even the Thessalonian church in chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. And how you turn from God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The Bible speaks of it constantly as the continuous hope of the church. This was the hope that carried the church through all their trials the ship which could not be sunk by all life's difficulties. It was the arms which carried them through all troubles and temptations. They held to it. They waited for it eagerly with patience and earnestness and prayer. Because they knew at any moment Jesus could return. Because he didn't give us a single day or specify the day or the hour. He even says that no one knows this day except the Father. And this is intentional And we should be very grateful for it. J.C. Ryle comments, and he says, there's a deep wisdom and mercy in this intentional silence. We have reason to thank God that this thing has been hidden from us. Uncertainty about the date of the Lord's return is calculated to keep believers in an attitude of constant expectation and to preserve them from despondency.
This wakefulness in light of the uncertainty of the return of, of the Lord was even spoken by, by our brother Jesus. Mark 13, 33, be on guard, keep awake. Why? He says, for you do not know when the time will come. So therefore we see the Bible continually speaking of this day in, in vague terms saying it is near or it is soon, but we don't have a specific date. And that purpose is to call believers to wake up and be in a constant state of hope and expectation. The Apostle Paul says so in Romans 13, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to awake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. Peter in 2 Peter 3. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. James tells us already, and the words already quoted, the coming of the Lord is at hand, and the judge is at the door. These words of nearness ought to be received as a child would receive them. Growing up, if my mom ever said we would soon go to the zoo, my expectation would be day after day that I would wake up and I'd hear the good news, today we're going to the zoo. A child hears the word soon and expects uh, imminent fulfillment. And so we are to receive these words as children. I am coming soon. And then truly expect him to come any moment. These words soon are intended for children and to be understood by children. Soon should fill your soul with hope. For it is soon that God will fully deliver you from all the various trials you are experiencing in this present moment. Because it's in that day that all Christians who are imprisoned for their faith will be set free. All those Christians who are moments away from dying for their faith will be immediately delivered. All those believers that are blind will see. The sick will be healed. The dead will be raised. The tempted will be instantaneously delivered. The sorrowful will rejoice. Every child of God and every kind of trial will be fully delivered in that day. And that day is soon. And so every moment ought to be lived out with constant hope and wakefulness because rescue is soon. But most of all, you will soon be brought into his presence forever. We will see him face to face who we now see in a mirror dimly. For now we, we hold fellowship with the unseen Christ, 1 Peter 1. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. And it will be in that day when the trump will sound and the Lord will descend and we will see him as he is, 1 John 3, verse 2. And so this present absence from the Lord should, should bring every single one of us great love sickness to our souls. For how can we love Jesus and not long to be with him? He even indicates to us, can the, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away and then they will fast. And the implication is not only will they fast, they will also mourn. They will long to be with him. They will long to see him face to face. Is it your greatest sorrow that you are not right now beholding the Lord of glory with your very eyes? Oh, consider, consider what a glorious day and return that will be. For who is it that returns to you, dear Christian? Who is it that will tear apart the heavens, rend the heavens and come down to rescue you? Who is it? It'll be the one that was crucified for your sins. The one who poured out his life unto death for your salvation. The one who has given you his Holy Spirit and new life. It is he who is altogether lovely. 
your beloved, your friend, your king, your merciful and faithful high priest. But one thing is for certain which Paul is careful to examine is that though the Lord is coming soon, there will be many who will not be ready. And this does not just mean that those people that openly deny the Lord and profess themselves as pagans, but those even who might sit next to you at church. Paul is addressing this issue because in the midst of being persecuted for their faith, there's a great temptation which the church encounters to abandon the faith that they first professed. This is the, the very reason why Paul sends Timothy to the Thessalonian church. It says, because he was, he was afraid that somehow the tempter had tempted them and that his labor would be in vain. The church truly did undergo great persecutions. He, he, he tells them in chapter 2, verse 14, you suffer the same things from your own countrymen as the Judean churches did from the Jews. Yet through these trials... These believers continued to hold fast to their hope and they did not abandon their faith. They held fast to the truth as they hoped fully in the coming day of the Lord. There was a correlation between their steadfastness and the movability of their faith and the steadfastness of their hope. They waited for the one who was near and so they endured all those many temptations and trials which came their way. Here's the reason why they endured simply, and again in chapter 110, they waited for God's Son from heaven. Now today, there are many present difficulties which you are all encountering, which are breeding grounds for temptations to seek to make you turn away from the faith. But here is the hope which is offered to you to have in this very moment that God has not destined you for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The imminent return of Jesus is reason to endure every temptation to sin which you are encountering on a constant basis. Because the very hour of temptation might be the very hour of his return. So regardless of what trouble you might be facing in this present hour, it is possible that Jesus will deliver you in the same hour. And so hear the call. Wake up. Let's look at verse 4. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Paul begins preparing us for the coming day of the Lord by reminding us of our position as children of the light. He begins with your adoption as sons and daughters into the household of God. And we know then that wakefulness is going to begin by knowing who you are in the sight of God. It is of utmost importance and concerning the coming day of the Lord that we are brought into great confidence knowing our position as children before the living God. For it is on the basis of your, of your justification, this adoption, that you will reach glorification. He will not leave you as an orphan. He will come again to you. And so by having a rich assurance that you are justified, we will therefore also have a great assurance that we will also be glorified. Because you cannot hope and long for his return if if you're uncertain of where you stand before him, if you're not even sure if you're a child. Because without a view of, of your position as a child, then there's nothing to hope for and long for in that day. However, as a child of the light, knowing your position gives you all the more uh, joy and anticipation to hope for that day and pray, come Lord Jesus. As children of the light, you do not belong to the darkness or the things of darkness. And as children of the light, there's no need for that day to terrify you. Rather, it is a day that should be hoped for and even hastened with fervent prayer. Because how can you pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus, if at his coming you will face judgment? But how much more so ought you to say, come, Lord Jesus, 
If at his coming you receive compassion and mercy and full salvation, who wants to hasten the coming day of judgment except for those who will receive compassion and mercy from the Lord's hands? Paul preludes this statement with but, which means he's contrasting the believer with those that are in darkness, the unbeliever, who are saying there's peace and security. Verse 3, while people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness. These people are, are caught off guard in the midst of their peace. They think that all is well until Jesus returns and then and comes like a thief in the night and they're ruined. They are in, in darkness for their minds are darkened and unbelief occupies their hearts. They've found, they've found peace in their own practices. They've suppressed the truth of God's wrath and have convinced themselves that all is well. Everything's good. We see that all the time in the world. Those signs above uh, the kitchen table, live, laugh, love. They love them. You see every Facebook profile picture and every picture in the house, it just smiles. Everything's good. Everything's just peace and security. But if we had more clear and vivid representations of what life is actually like, we wouldn't really see that in, in most houses. We like to convince ourselves all is well and nothing's well. We see that in the whole world. Their darkness is due to their ignorance of God's righteousness and the wrath that he has revealed against them. They've settled in their own homes. They have secured themselves with every possible safety feature. They see themselves as fortified against every sort of disaster. They have health insurance, life insurance, home insurance, car insurance, guns in every room, food on every shelf, cameras in every corner, walls on every side, airbags for every seat, vitamins for every morning, a 401k for a perfect retirement plan. They have a consistent church attendance. They've read through the Bible. They've written in the cover the day they were saved. They've gone up to the altar call, not once, not twice, but thrice. They have dedicated and rededicated and rededicated their lives to the Lord. They've given to charity. They've gained the title as a good person. And they've found refuge and in insufficient refuges. Though they fortify themselves with all these things and have peace abounding all around them, yet they have not fled to the one refuge who's able to save them from the coming day of the Lord, Jesus Christ. What does our Lord call them? He calls them fools, complete fools. Mankind will prepare for wars and famine and disasters and financial difficulty, but so few prepare for the coming day of the Lord, which is nearer to us than all of those things. And then Jesus will come to them, and though they have all these securities, they're going to be found unprotected. They will not escape. Though they hide themselves beneath mighty mountains, the Lord will come and no creature will be hidden from his sight, but will be naked and exposed before the eyes of him of whom we all must give an account. There may be a mountain big enough to protect you from a nuclear explosion, but there will not be a mountain big enough to protect you from the coming day of the Lord. You can fortify yourselves beneath many mighty mountains, but in that day he'll remove it and cast it into the sea, and there you will be naked and exposed before him. And so there is no more dangerous place to be, but in a place of security and peace in your own strivings while not trusting in Jesus Christ. And that is these very people that Paul is describing. And the greatest tragedy is that many of you are ordering your lives in such a way with such a determination so that you can finally say peace and security. And what describes the American dream better but the lifelong pursuit of peace and security? So you can just say all is well. And it has crept into the church and has taken place of the simple trust in Jesus Christ. But this must not be the case. 
with the believer. For Paul says, you yourselves are fully aware that the Lord will come like a thief. In other words, you know that at any moment, you're not ignorant. You know that at any moment, he will come and take his friends to himself and cast his enemies away forever. And so today, I leave you with no excuse as I have reminded you of the nearness of the Lord. If he comes today and he finds you sleeping, what will he say to you except that he sent his messenger to bark at you and tell you he is near? Wake up. Don't be sluggish and unwilling. Pay attention. Stop snoozing your conscience like you do your alarm each morning. Wake up upon hearing this alarm, lest you are woken up by the voice of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. We must not think that soon is anything but this next hour. For saying that it is not any time soon, it's, it's in a far out distance, it will cast you into sleep. The word soon should rather make us all the more awake. Because the one who is not slow to fulfill his promises, he comes leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. He is coming soon, quickly. Don't let this day surprise you like a thief. You're not in darkness for this day to surprise you. As a child of the light, there is no reason why it should surprise you. You are not ignorant that he is near. So why are, are we often so convinced that he's not going to come this next day or this next hour or this next week? Why? It's because we likely want to just hold on to the world for one more hour, one more day, one more week. And how revealing that is to our own hearts when we see what we prize more than that day. For if you... For if what you want most in this next hour is anything but the Lord, what does that say about your love for Jesus? When he comes, there will be not one person destined for salvation that will say, Lord, if you only just waited one more hour or one more day or, or one more week, would you have just waited if I finally just gotten married or, or had kids or that perfect retirement plan or that beach house? If you would have just waited... No, rather we will be fully satisfied as we see him face to face and be glad. How wonderful is this day? And shall we not hope for it today? There's nothing better for you to have in this present hour but to be face to face with Jesus, to be in his presence forever. So wake up. Because today might be that final grain of sand that is dropping in that hourglass. And Jesus comes. Wake up. Continuing, so then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Sleep belongs to the night. Since we are children of the light and we belong to the day, we are not to sleep. As children of the light... We are not to sleep or get drunk, but we are to stay awake and be sober. How do we sleep as others do? Verse 7 tells us that those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. They distract themselves and occupy their minds with all these numbing solutions. And this passage is not just telling us uh, to stay uh, awake and to stay away from excessive drinking, but also a spiritual sobriety. For if it was just merely literal sobriety, then we would also have to conclu conclude that it's literal sleep. And Jesus is not calling us to pull all-nighters until he comes. And so therefore, sleep and drunkenness, although it can also be literal, but they're also figurative. It's trying to convey 
an idea to us. It means that we're not to be distracting ourselves away from the hope that is set before us. For you can abstain from all alcohol as a Christian and yet still not be sober-minded. You maybe do not drink, but still you're a drunk. And you're thrown into a stupor of all sorts of distractions. To sleep means to live as though you are dead. When I get to ride the train up to Denver on a snowy day, it happens to be that a lot of homeless people will enter into the train, and sadly, some of them will bring in their drugs. Lately, it's been the fentanyl, and they'll smoke it in the train. And they just, they, they sleep, and they wake up, and they're just consumed, looking at their drug. And they look as though they're dead. They just, they'll stand and sleep, and they'll, they'll drop their stuff and wake up and pick it back up and sleep. And then I just look to my left, and I see a young man or young woman, nicely ordered, well-dressed, and they don't look much different, except instead of having drugs in front of them, they have a cell phone, and they're just dead. They're lifeless. They're just completely distracting themselves. Which one of these was sleeping? Who was the drunk? The answer is both. This deadness, it comes from a deep forgetfulness of his nearness. My brothers and sisters, when we give in to that idea that Jesus is not coming soon, we are simply taking spiritual melatonin from Satan's medicine cabinet. If we fail to see he is near, we're getting drunk off of Satan's liquor. Procrastination and distractions of all sorts are the worst alcohol for the Christian. It will always bring us into spiritual drunkenness and drowsiness and sleepiness. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will strike. Worse than that, a little sleep, a little slumber, and the judge will come like a thief. Wake up. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. In light of uh, of what we belong to as children of God, we are to keep ourselves from everything which casts us into sleepiness and, and drunkenness. Paul argues again by, uh, by means of contrasting the believer to the unbeliever. They sleep and they get drunk at night, but we belong to the day. We don't belong to the night, so it's unfitting for us to live in such a manner. Ephesians 5.18 sums us up perfectly. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. What should we do instead, Paul? But be filled with the Spirit. In contrast to those who get drunk and they're, they're clothed with their own false senses of security and peace. In contrast to those, the Christian is to be filled with the Spirit, awake, sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul shows us a soldier, and he depicts one who is truly ready for the coming day of the Lord. He chooses this defensive armor, the breastplate and the helmet, not to draw us necessarily to the specific pieces of armor, but to draw us to the the faith and the hope and the love, and that they are defensive. To show us that the one thing to defend us from this drunkenness and the sleepiness, to keep us awake and sober, is to put on love, faith, and hope. So the Christian who is ready who is sober, is one who's equipped with faith, who's put on love and has a full assurance of hope. Turn over to to chapter 1. And we'll look at verses 2 through 3. As the Thessalonian church uh, conveys this wakefulness and this sobriety, Paul says in verse uh, verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, 
remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. To put on this armor means you, you're clinging to the cross. You're holding fast your gaze upon Jesus Christ, wishing to know nothing but Christ Jesus and him crucified. Trusting in that as your salvation. To, to love God and love one another, even as he has loved us. Laboring for one another, not growing weary of doing good to one another. Hoping daily in the salvation which the Lord will bring at any moment. That is the armor. Practically, let us be a people who earnestly seeks the Lord to feast, but not on the earth's delicacies, but from the master's table. Reading this precious book through which we commune and hold fellowship with our Lord. Seeking him in earnest prayer with confidence drawing near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. If we truly examined our lives, every hour would be a time of need. Continually seeking the Lord, even at the end of Thessalonians. He says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing Day by day, waiting for him, hastening that day. Come, Lord Jesus, because we are needy. We are to seek to be with the Lord now as we will be with him forever. And nothing will strengthen your faith and your love and your hope but seeking the Lord on that daily basis, longing for him, how can you long for the one that, that you barely even know, that you just ignore and then you, you, you push him on the back burner and then you don't even care or remember and he's neglected? What's more precious than Jesus? Indeed, he's the most precious to be sought after on a daily basis as he will be found by those who seek him. Paulin is finishing with the greatest reason why we are to be awake, sober, and equipped as a soldier. He says in verse 9, for God, so he's explaining why we should put on this armor, why we should be awake, for God has not destined us for wrath, for an eternity of hell, rather, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, that is, alive or dead, we might live with him. Child of God, you are destined to obtain salvation. You are called to God's glory. And this ought to make you long for that coming day. And so let your life be full of such prayers. Come, Lord Jesus, and how long, O oh Lord? You're, you're set apart for that day. Let it cause your heart to cry out, come. Even as John did at the end of Revelation, come, Lord. Come quickly, Lord. How long? How long? Can you bear the thought of living another day without the sight of the one whom your soul loves? See, you are destined, whether awake or asleep, to live with him and to live with him forever. Is that not your greatest joy? Is it not a, a fullness of joy in his presence? Pleasures forevermore? Let us long for that day. There's nothing better than that day. There's nothing more fulfilling than that day. And that day might be today. Was this not the hope of the thief on the cross who would be with the Lord on that very day? Jesus says, truly, I, will say, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us live every day as if it is the last day 
where at the end of the day, we will be with Jesus in paradise. How does that completely change and transform our lives to live and long for the Lord? It's the very reason why that thief endured that cross. If I get to be with the Lord today, what does it matter what comes upon me? What if they crucify me and, 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 and kill me and whip me and tear me apart? What does it matter? Today I will be with the Lord. Today I'll be with Jesus. Do you hope for that? Do you long for that? He's destined to take you into his inner chambers, to bring you into his banqueting house, to sit you beneath the banner of his love. And do we not long for that day? He's destined you to embrace you with his right hand forever, to smile upon you for eternity, to sing over you with loud shouts of joy and give you himself. Do you see what salvation awaits you? Do you see what precious Jesus you will be forever with? Do you see those costly jewels that adorn that crown of life and righteousness purchased by his own blood? Do you see it? Long for it, beloved. Long for it. He died for us that we might live with him. Do you see the cost of your eternal life, of your salvation, his own blood? Therefore, let your heart be full of hope to be in paradise with the Lord today. And then make your cry to Jesus Make haste, my beloved. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Come quickly, Lord. Come quickly. <coughs> my greatest sorrow is that this salvation only waits the child of God, and there are so many who are, who are just living, and at the end of their life is wrath. Only the child of God is destined to obtain salvation, and the path is broad, and the population, and there's so many people. Open your eyes to see how broad that path is. When you drive on I-25, look at all the traffic, and see just all those people, and they're just carelessly wandering and on their way to this end of wrath. And so I address you, unbeliever. I address you to look no further than the cross for all your peace and for all your security. All the things that you, you try to accumulate for yourselves will not do it. Only Jesus can give you that peace. For he has come, Ephesians 2, to, to preach peace to those who are far off and peace to those who are near. Psalm 86, let me hear what God the Lord will say, for he shall speak peace to his people. There's only peace that comes from God, and it's in Christ Jesus who died for us. So that whether we are far or whether we are near, that we could come to him. Do you believe in this? He pleads with you. He pleads with you. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He pleads with you. He earnestly desires. He's even not even returning yet because he wants you to be led to repentance and faith in him. He opens his hand and says, come. He says, come. Don't let the same hand that says, come, be the same hand that pushes you away and says, depart from me. Let it be the simple alarm of this small man that is saying, come to Jesus and live rather than 
the clouds tearing apart and Jesus coming down with the voice of an archangel with the trumpet of God and saying, depart from me, I never knew you. Today is the day of salvation. Stop hiding yourselves under all these many mountains of your own righteousness and securities and peace and hopes. It does nothing for you. There's one refuge that is sufficient to save you from all your sins. Your peace and security will do no more for you than wearing a mask will do from defending you from a, from a gunshot or than a life jacket will do for you while you're skydiving. You need a sufficient refuge. And Jesus says, here I am. Come to me. And so I plead with you, and I've been praying for you, that you would come to Jesus Christ and be saved. It's my one desire for all that are dead in here today, that you would find life in Christ Jesus, who gives it to all freely and abundantly. And that those that are asleep would wake up, for this day is near. The day of salvation is today. Today is offered, come to me, but tomorrow might only be the words, depart from me. So come to him. Come to him. Christians, read with me verse 11. Because we are so prone to forget and get discouraged. Here's your exhortation for one another in your fellowship in your prayers, in your serving. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Also in chapter 4, verse 18, therefore, encourage one another with these words. We all know how quickly we forget this coming day. And we need to be a people that reminds each other because we are quick to forget. Let us not go home sleeping and ignoring this truth. He's coming soon. Let us encourage one another, reminding each other, building each other up. Are you awake? Are you awake? Let us pray to the, the only one who can truly wake us up and give us this life, which we need to be awake. Lord Jesus, you and you alone can, can wake up every sleeping, tired soul that is in our midst today. And so I beg you, as you're the one who, who knows who has perhaps fallen asleep and has forgotten this hope, you know who needs to be woken up. I pray that you would wake them up. Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead and let Christ shine on you. Oh, Lord, rise these sleepers from the dead. Shine upon them. Let all these saints be encouraged and built up, seeing that they will be with you forever. And may we as a body fast and mourn and long to be with you and encourage each other and stir each other up, seeing how close this day is. May we all be found as these guard dogs, Lord, that are just barking at each other to wake up. Oh, forgive us, Lord, for how often we sleep. How often I sleep. Oh, Lord, we belong to this day. We're children of the light. Your children. Lord, for your sake of your steadfast love toward us, wake us up. Don't let us go back to our, the busy life and sleep. To not just be awake on Sundays and sleep six days a week, but to be awake day after day, morning after morning, hour after hour, 5 a.m. and 5 p.m., waiting 
wakeful, watchful. Not walking foolishly as outsiders, but in wisdom. Making best use of the time, seeing those days draw near. Not neglecting to meet together with one another as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and stirring each other up to love and good works. All the more so as the stage draws near, stir in the hearts of your people, Lord Jesus. Stir in their hearts. Wakefulness and sobriety. Oh Lord, you know my greatest sadness would be to see a single one of these faces who's been here week after week, day after day, Bible study after Bible study, who's heard the gospel and yet has never left their own false peace and security and run to Jesus Christ, who alone can save them. Lord, you alone are able to save to the utmost those who draw near to God through you. And so we look to you as the one who's able and beg you as the one who's able. Save to the utmost. To the very last day, save Lord Jesus. Save sinners. Oh God, there's no other name there's no other God who can do what I ask right now except you. So I beg you, Lord, for your glory, for your name's sake, wake up your people and, and save the sinners. May there be even one who hears this gospel and comes to Jesus. Oh, Father, welcome in one more even, even one more child into your household today. I ask this in your name. Amen.